Good morning, church family. Welcome back to our online Sunday school. I'm glad you're here with us today. This is our last week to begin Romans and our last week to have this online Sunday school format. So let's pray before we get into our lesson, okay? Father, thank you for today. Thank you for your word to us. Thank you for speaking to us, for loving us so much that you would be with us here today with your Holy Spirit, teaching us through your word. Help us to be like you. Help us to be like your son, Jesus, through all that we do in your name. Amen. All right, now we're, we're back in Romans. We're finishing up our study of the letter. Now, Paul, we're going to be looking at Romans chapter 15 primarily, but Paul is tying things all together. In fact, we see here what Paul is doing is actually tying something he mentioned in the very beginning of the letter into his closing remarks. Now, remember, all throughout this letter to the Romans, the church in Rome, Paul has been equipping them with the doctrines of the faith. He's, probably, he's trying to explain to them why they believe what they believe and why the gospel is important, why sinful man needed a savior through Jesus, because there's nothing that they, uh, we or anyone or, or any person could do. Our position before God was that we were sinners and there's nothing that we could do to change that. But God, in his provision, provided Jesus a perfect sacrifice for our sin, his son, to die and to rise again for our sins. And salvation being made right with God, the justification that we receive comes through believing in who Jesus is and what he did for us. And when we've taken that step and we put our faith in Christ, we receive the grace of God, which puts us into a new life, brings us into new life in Christ that we live by the Holy Spirit. The past several weeks, we've been looking as Paul has built that foundation of doctrine. Then he starts to move into theology, putting the things that we believe, what we believe about God, into life. And so he started with Romans chapter 12, talking about all of life being an act of worship, giving your life to the Lord, and everything you do is worship to Him. And he went specific directions with that. And even last week, we saw about how there were two groups of people that Paul addressed, those of weak faith and those of strong faith, and not trying to say that one is better than the other or above one another, but just saying there are people at different levels of their faith believing things that had to do with, in Rome, it had to do with things that were being eaten about with like meat and vegetables or days that were celebrated as holy and even the issue of drinking wine. So we're continuing on with that, but Paul is also transitioning into making this a closing section of the letter. And the one thing that we're going to see that's been a thread throughout the whole letter that Paul is tying an end on, if you will, is the fact that the gospel is for everyone. I want to start by reading something at the very beginning of the letter. In Romans chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, Paul wrote this, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. He builds the whole letter off of that, where the gospel is for everyone and it's through faith. Not through our merit or what we do, but it's through our faith. So, in Romans chapter 15 today, we're looking together at these verses and Paul continues on with the, with the idea that the gospel is for everyone. And he's trying to push the church on, not only to be unified together as one family, but also to allow the love of God to overflow out of their hearts. Let's look at this together and then we'll look through our three questions as we have been doing. Paul writes, verse uh, 1 of chapter 15, We who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good, to build him up. For Christ did not please himself, because as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, that through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another, in accord with Christ Jesus, that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. 
For I tell you that Christ became a servant to the circumcised to show God's truthfulness in order to confirm the promises given to the patriarchs and in order that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. As it is written, therefore I will praise you among the Gentiles and sing to your name. And again it is said, rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and let all the peoples extol him. And again Isaiah says, the root of Jesse will come. Even he who arises to rule the Gentiles, in him will the Gentiles hope. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. Some very, very powerful words as Paul is moving to the end of his letter. Now, let's look through our method again. Remember, we've got our three questions that we're using to study the Bible so that we understand the full meaning of what was written to the original audience, what was written to everyone, and what is written to us. So, the first question that we look at, again, what does God say to them, the original audience? Now, again, Paul's bringing this letter to a close, and he has been looking all throughout Romans at this idea that the gospel is for everyone. And even as in chapter 14, in the section before this, Paul addressed this issue of disputed matters, opinions between different levels of faith, urging people to welcome one another to be unified and to be humble like Christ was humble. And to sometimes, especially to the strong, Paul's message was to the strong, Sometimes we have to bear with the weak, as it were, because that's what Christ did for us. And he moves on into this idea of salvation and how salvation is for everyone. And we see that through how Christ fulfilled not only the promises to God's people, the Jews, but then through the plan and the will of God, moved to the Gentiles as well. Now, he puts this here as a reminder to both Jew and Gentile. Now, we're seeing that here, that Christ fulfilled his promise. Back in Genesis chapter 22, we see this specifically when God is speaking to Abraham. After Abraham was on Mount Moriah with Isaac, and he is willing to put forth Isaac to God and to to give him to God, and God says, stop, you don't have to do that. And after that, he looks at Abraham and he promises him that his descendants will be as numerous as the stars in the sky, and also that all nations of the, the world, all people in the world will be blessed through his descendant. Now, we see the fulfillment of that promise in Christ. Jesus came to the Jews first, but then the gospel, I mean, he ministered to many Gentiles, many people who aren't Jews in his ministry. But we see that salvation came, especially after Jesus left the earth and the disciples came together and through the time of Pentecost and the church starts in Jerusalem, but then it goes out into the whole entire world. And through Jesus, all of this is fulfilled. And what Paul reminds them is that God has welcomed them all, not just the Gentiles and not just the Jews. So the reminder is to the Jews that God's plan has always been to reach everyone, not just the Jews. And he reminds the Gentiles that God has reached you, but also the Jews are a part of this plan. He's trying to bring everyone together. He's trying to push everyone to unity. He's trying to push them past any kind of ethnic or cultural boundary, any kind of boundary that would separate them, because now they find themselves together in the family of God in the church. And that's what Paul is trying to push the church in Rome to, to see that, to welcome one another as Christ has welcomed them. We see between the lines here that there's been some issues that people have been, instead of embracing unity through Christ's undeserved mercy, they've seen their differences as sources of pride to look down upon one another. And Paul is pushing them to go past that. Paul reminds every reader, again, Christ has welcomed you. So how can you not welcome someone else into the family of God? How can you not be like Christ was to you? That's what Paul is pushing them to think and consider. And he, notice what he says in verse 13. This is a powerful prayer. He says, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, 
so that the, by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. As Paul is reminding them that Christ has welcomed them, and even as he quotes these Old Testament scriptures to show how God's will has always been to reach the entire world, to reach everyone with the gospel, he says, may you be filled, may God fill you with all hope and joy in believing so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. He's telling them that he, well, his prayer for them is that God will pour into them that through their unity together, through their relationship with the Lord, that out of that relationship, out of the hope and joy found in God and in the faith that they have, that the gospel will overflow out of their hearts by the power of the Holy Spirit. It will be an authentic response to who God is, an authentic relationship with God. Paul doesn't want a manufactured or some sort of um, fake response to the gospel where people are just learning something to say and trying to get people to join their organization. He wants the gospel and the family of God to be something that flows out of God working in their hearts, an authentic relationship with Him. Now, that, those are some powerful words from Paul to the church in Rome. But what does God say to everyone? And the second question of our method, we're looking at the principles of the text. What does God say to everyone through this passage to the church in Rome? And the, the, the key truth that we see through all of this is that the gospel unites the family of God together and pours out of hearts overflowing with the love of God. Let me say that again. The gospel unites the family of God together and pours out of hearts overflowing with the love of God. We see here a principle of the text that applies to anyone at any time is that God's grace knows no boundaries. Regardless of country, creed, class, or color, God's grace is for all. Paul started his letter with this and he's ending his letter with this too. He's reminding them that this is not just for a certain type of person or a certain group of people. It is for everyone. And we as Christ followers and the church, we must embrace this. We must be known by this. That we bear God's grace, that we share God's grace and good news with everyone. That it's for everyone. Christ welcomed us and we must welcome others to the family of God. We must be known by our love. We saw that last week. We must strive for unity in the church. The world must look on us and see a love that doesn't make sense, a love and a unity with one another inside the church that crosses any kind of boundaries. Because today, more than ever, we need that kind of news in our world. We need the good news of Jesus, that His grace, His gospel is for all especially with today, when, when we just hear the news today of, of people who are being treated so poorly and being killed just because they're a certain color of their skin. We see that in our country today, how people are being divided. And we as the church must be known by our message that God's grace, His love is for all. What would our world look like if we were known by that? If that's how people saw us? We also see that sin and pride put up walls around our hearts. It puts up a wall. That's what sin does in our life. When we do not have the love and hope and joy in our hearts, when instead we turn to our pride and our sin, it puts up walls around our hearts where, where we don't pour out the gospel with others where we look down upon others because they're different from us. People inside the church might look down upon those who aren't, who don't have the grace of God. We've seen that already. Paul wrote to that to the church in Rome, where instead of a source of inspiration to share the grace of God with others, we see that those who have received God's grace used it instead of as, as a source of pride to look down upon either someone who has weaker faith or stronger faith or those outside of the family of God. We cannot do that. We must instead 
Allow God's love and joy to pour into our hearts and tear down the walls that we put up from our sin and pride. In the, midst of, in the midst of such a divide in our country today, we as Christ followers can demonstrate the gospel, can show people what the gospel looks like in action by our distinctiveness, by being different in showing grace and mercy, by living as Jesus lived, treating people like he treated them. Finally, we see that sharing the gospel naturally flows out of an authentic relationship with Jesus. As Paul prayed in verse 13, he was praying, May the God of hope fill you with, excuse me, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. He knew that, that when there's something so incredible that you experience or that you have, you can't help but share it with someone else. That's what a real, authentic relationship with God is like. Just like when you have a relationship with someone and it, and it brings you so much joy and love, you can't help but share that relationship with someone else, either through pictures or telling people or today through social media or something like that. Or if there's something that you love to do, you can't help but share that with someone else or something that you have experienced like an example that you might think of, you go to a restaurant and it's so great and you just go and tell someone, but you've got to go try this. This was some of the best food I've ever had. Or you go to some place in the world on vacation or on a trip and you're like, you've got to go and try this. Or you get together with friends and you said, look at these pictures of my family. No one teaches you how to share that. No one's got to tell you, you know what, you really should tell people about that. I mean, no one's got to push you to share the things that we, you love, the things that we enjoy, the things that are part of our lives that bring us joy and hope. No one has to tell us how to share it. No one has to challenge us to share it. No one has to teach us how to share it. We just share it. And the most natural way to share the gospel is out of a heart filled with the love and hope of God. We see that. Now, the flip side is, if we don't ever spend time with God, if we don't ever spend time, as Paul said in verse 5 of this, excuse me, in verse 4, that the scripture brings us encouragement and endurance, it brings us hope. If we never spend time with God's word or in time in prayer with the Father, meditating on the truth of Him, praising His name, we never spend time in personal worship with God, we'll never know what that authentic relationship is like. Just like if we didn't spend time with people that we know and love, we never would have a real relationship with them. It would be surface level. It would be talking about the weather. It would be things like that. The, the, the relationships that we have in our lives that are this deep because we just don't know that person. If our relationship like is like that with God, then it'll be very difficult to share with someone the gospel, to share about his love and his hope and his grace if we've never really experienced that for ourselves. Now, before we move on to our third question, I want to make this statement and just put this out there as a last principle of the text, that a real relationship with God comes from spending real time with him. Finally, our last question, personal application. What is God saying to me? These are questions that I ask myself and that I hope might challenge you to ask yourself as well. First question that I ask myself through this to answer what is the personal application for me in the text is, how real is my relationship with God? Is God just a relationship that I have because I go to church, because I go to Bible study? because I know about him? Or do I have a real relationship with him? Do I struggle with sharing the gospel because I'm afraid or is it just because I don't really know what to say because I don't have a relationship with God? I don't really have that depth of knowledge or experience with him through who he is. Either we know Jesus, maybe we, have, maybe we follow him, but we just don't have a deep relationship with him or a meaningful relationship with him or maybe 
you are watching this today, you go to Sunday school, you go to church, but you don't really have a relationship with him. You know about God, but you don't know God. There's a difference. I also have to ask myself, do I welcome others as Christ welcomed me? Do I treat people like he treated me? I don't deserve the mercy that he gave me, but still I struggle with my pride. I struggle with it. I think we, we all do. We all struggle with that pride. I have to ask myself, do I treat people like Christ treated me? Do I welcome them like Christ welcomed me? And that comes back to spending time with him. I will become more like Jesus through the work of the Holy Spirit when I spend time with him. Now, I am in no way saying, nor is Paul teaching, that we should tolerate sin. This isn't a message of tolerance and saying, well, it's okay if you do this, or it's okay if you're a sinner. It is in the sense that Christ welcomes all to put their faith in him, to believe in him and call him Lord. But there still is a component where everyone must put their faith in Jesus and deny themselves and follow him. And that's not a message of tolerance for sin. That's just a message that everyone is welcome in the family of God. But you have to put your faith in God. And even as we read through Paul, there's no way we could read through Romans and see this message that everything is okay and you can do whatever you want and be whatever you want. No, what Paul says, even in chapter 12, we see that our spiritual act of worship is to be transformed by the renewing of our mind, to give our whole lives to God. But the beauty of that, and that may seem harsh to someone, that, that, that's why people, even if we could be the best church that we could be, people would still have a problem with it because they reject God's truth, because they reject God. In Romans chapter 1, Paul explains that. That's where this all started. That's where sin comes from. Our pride rejects God. But the good news is, and deep down within every person, is that brokenness between them and God, him or her and God. In between every, every person, they, they, they have that, and they're longing to be made right again. We have the good news. Some will accept that, some won't. But still, our part is to welcome anyone that would give their lives to God, to, to believe in Christ. Finally, my last question is, Jesus had compassion on the crowns. And do I have that same compassion? Do I have it? In Matthew 9, 36, we see that verse where Jesus looked on the crowns and he had compassion because they were like sheep without a shepherd. They were harassed. He saw people broken by injustice, broken by sin, broken by pride. And he had compassion on them. And that ties into what Paul is trying to teach the church in Rome what the Holy Spirit is teaching us through this today. Do we love each other like Christ loved us? Do we welcome one another like He welcomed us? I hope you all wrestle with this like I did. And the events of the past few days that we have seen in our country today should give us pause as the church to ask ourselves, are we living like Jesus? Are we acting like Jesus? Are we acting like the family of God? Or are we missing the mark? Are we distinct in our world today? Is our relationship with God, the relationship that each of us have with God, is it real and authentic enough that the grace and mercy and gospel would flow out of us, overflow as if someone poured too much water into a glass and it just fills over the top? Is that true of us today? Is that true of me? We as the church cannot continue on allowing sin and pride to build up walls and keeping us away from the world. Instead, we are to go into the world as one family and share the good news of Christ. I want to leave us with this verse today. The last verses of this letter as we conclude our study and our time together. 
Chapter 16, verse 25. Now to him who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery that was kept for secret for long ages, but has now been disclosed and through prophetic writings has been made known to all nations, according to command of the eternal God, to bring about the obedience of faith to the only wise God be glory forevermore through Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen, and God bless you.